Hello and welcome. A few years ago when you went, got into a car and went driving, the only way you could find your way around or one of the ways you could find your way around was by using a little device from a company called TomTom Tom or Garmin and you used to put that on the dashboard and they really follow instructions. That's changed thanks to companies like Google which now allow you to access that on a mobile phone. And so what do companies like TomTom Tom do next? Well, that's the question I'm going to put to Corinne Vicru, the co-founder of TomTom Tom and uh, based in Holland. Uh, Corinne, thank you very much for speaking with us. Yeah, thank so you. I know that you've been talking about uh, what failure means and, and perhaps this is one of the best instances of a company that's faced huge headwinds and, and a tectonic shift in business and yet come back in, in a way that perhaps many people didn't uh, predict. They so didn't what, expect, yeah. Didn't expect. <laughs> so walk us through that journey. Yes, I think that's uh, so it's been a long journey. We set up the company 25 years ago and uh, in an extremely competitive environment uh, with technology moving at, you know, huge, huge space. So, uh, yeah, we, when we, we, bought the f we did the first uh, P&Ds in 2004, we were the first one really to bring that to, to a mass audience, to really democratize navigation. Actually, if you, at that time, the zero to one million to, was faster than mobile phones. So the acceptance of personal navigation device was extremely fast. It was really answering a need. And the market went and it boomed and the company went from 40 million to 1.8 billion turnover. We sold tens of millions of units. And then 2008. Mm. And 2008 is a bit of a perfect storm. Mm. Um, you have uh, the economic crisis and consumer spending starts going down. We have reached quite a level of penetration. We've sold a lot of devices throughout the world. Um, and we just bought our map maker, Teleatlas, for uh, for hefty sum and we're quite indebted. Um, and Google decides to bring navigation for free on mobile phones. All that in the same year. And most people just saw that's it, that's the end of TomTom. Tom. Uh, that wasn't without reckoning of a very strong, dedicated company that really wanted to, to make a difference. So we turned it around. Um, we, we had predicted that in consumer electronics, you know that at some point things will will happen, that you do reach a level of penetration mm -hmm. and therefore uh, things are going to start to get more competitive. So we had already anticipated that and that was the reason behind the purchase of Teleatlas. Uh, we wanted to really develop the technology behind the product as well. So uh, our dream was to say, well, you know, we want to know what's happening on the road in real time. Mm -hmm because then we can give the best information to our customers. Wouldn't it be wonderful if, if they could get that information as it happens, as the bridge is closing or the roads get flooded or, uh, and understand traffic information. So before 2008, we had started investing quite heavily into those technology, traffic information and map making. Uh, and as you know, the future of mobility is changing beyond recognition. Uh, again, technology there will help. Millions of people are dying on the road every day. I think it's the equivalent of 2747 mm. dying, mm. crashing every day. Uh, you have a huge amount of congestion that's just polluting our cities beyond uh, what's acceptable. And technology there as well w will help. And we are participating in that mobility revolution, if you want, with all our expertise on uh, map making, traffic information, and also bringing software to drivers. Right, and of these uh, areas, whether it's traffic information or map making, what according to you is the critical uh, or the distinctive edge uh, that a company like TomTom Tom has? Well, so, so we've got, first of all, a lot of experience. We sold nearly 100 million of those navigation devices. So we have a good, uh, and the reason we've done that is because we've managed to make product where the friction between the man and the machine is as little as possible, where our products are very easy to use. So and we have a lot of customer feedback. We understand the driver probably better than anyone. So that, that's one about that customer mm. experience. Uh, the other thing is we've been investing in map making for an awful long time. Mm. Uh, the idea behind the purchase of Teleatlas at the time was the fact that we had a lot of data. I mean, talk about big data. We've got more data than, than you can imagine. Uh, we, we map the whole world. We can redraw the whole world every 20 minutes with just our trace data. So, uh, so this, this is a, a big richness in terms of, of map data and traffic information. We're one of the biggest provider right. in the world. So uh, let, me, let me come back to the software part yeah. in a bit, but what are the, let's say, the three most interesting insights that you can share with us in terms of how drivers behave? 
Yeah, so I think what, what, what it, it's like the, 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 the way people interact with technology, you don't want to feel it's there. So it needs to be very intuitive. So you don't want to have any interaction with the software. So what's important in, in the cockpit, in the car, uh, is uh, not too many buttons. Uh, you want to have just the minimum of voice commands. People just want that navigation to, to be there and be very uh, non-intrusive, if you want. So that's, that's the, the, the one thing. So, and, and it, so that's one thing that's good. The other thing is, it depends per region, mm. not one, two consumers the same. So you see very different behavior, for example, in, uh, in Asia that you see in India, where navigation is different, it's by point of interest, the addressing is different uh, than in the US or in Europe. So we've got all that understanding as well that there isn't one consumer, one behavior throughout the world. So we can adapt our product and make sure. So who, are the, who are the best behaved drivers? Aha. Uh -huh. Now don't get me there. I don't know. It's <laughs> <laughs> not the Italians. I don't think so. It's. Uh, I think everybody's got a different cultures about driving. I think the. Uh, you know, in Europe, uh, people like driving fast cars, and and uh, we. Uh, so I think it, well, it is a difficult question to answer. But uh, and if yeah. I look at driving in India, it's 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 again something completely different. So. Uh, What's interesting, people asking themselves is, will people relent their cars? Do people love driving or will they be able to stop on a big computer with wheels, which is going to be the self-driving car of the future? And those are interesting questions. How are the drivers going to interact with, with, with the car and the machine in the, in, or, or people really like the freedom that the car is giving them? So we're going to go through a massive transformation of mobility and it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I yeah. don't have all the answers. Right. So and, and let me put that question to you next then. You know, so as you look at the future of mobility and uh, one critical part of that obviously is cars that are self-driving. Uh, how do you see uh, that shaping up? Uh, how good is the technology and the inputs that people like you or companies like you are giving to it to ensure that it's, it's safe, secure and efficient? Well, f first of all, I think that like every technology, it takes much longer than you think mm. to mature. Mm. At the same time, towards the end it goes much faster than you think. Mm. So I've seen this happening with mobile phone as well, where we'll be talking about it in the early 90s and all of a sudden the, the technology is there, the, 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 the chips are there, uh, the uh, computer power, the price, and it can all facilitate. The role will play is on the mapping side. So on a self-driving car, you need to position the car within two centimeters on the road. Mm. Okay, so those are very different technologies that does just GPS. And then you need to get the information from the car to the cloud back to the car in real time. So things will, will uh, that will take some time, but this is, it, it will happen. Now, when difficult to say, um, I think, People are at CES, uh, they were saying 10, 15 years. What I know is that there is an awful lot of investment uh, that's happening in the industry, car makers, uh, semiconductor uh, manufacturers, but uh, people like NVIDIA, uh, lots of companies, Microsoft are investing in those technologies, so uh, in, in their own, in their different uh, area of expertise. So it will happen at some point. Right, so you said, you know, 2008 was a low point in many ways. So tell us about what made you and how did you pull yourself together and your team and then come back with a different strategy and a different focus to the point that you are today yeah so I, I think that so the, the when the chips are down I think as entrepreneur you life is never linear and I think in I think Jeff Hilmet also said that in one of the panels uh, you need to have an awful lot of resilience I think the key is not to lose sight of the problem you're trying to solve so what is the vision, what is the long-term problem you're trying to solve? And I think that's, uh, that's what we, uh, we never lost sight of. And even in the darkest moment when you think, how, how are we going to do this? How are we going to respond fast enough? Because we never really doubted that we had what it take, we had the good vision for the future, but technology changes really fast. You need to bring your organization and get rid of your legacy software. You need to make big investment decisions at the right time. So the amount of decision making you have to make all the time is, is quite mind boggling. Mm. Uh, you do that with a team that's very together, that share a very common vision, um, but that's also that's very complementary. And I think that that's one way for us to go over those hurdles. The other way is we had uh, very talented people in the organization. 
um, and we managed to nurture that culture and train a lot of people from inside. That are, we, we have a good company culture where people feel they can express themselves uh, and they help us uh, and the organization as a whole to solve those big issues we were talking about earlier. So I think that's the way we managed to, uh, to sort of go Come over on. the waves and, and, and cope. Right, and, and as you look ahead again, uh, personally what are the two or three things that you're focused on and what's on your dashboard in terms of either a threat, an opportunity, or wa a warning signal? Yeah, I think, I think you know, we're competing, so I'm not talking about, it's, it's always an opportunity in technology. Mm -hmm. I, I, the, the, the fascinating thing about technology is in the end you don't know who's going to win. You never know. Mm. I mean, if someone had told you in the early 2000s that the company would win the mobile phone war would be Apple. Samsung and Apple, you would not have believed it. Yeah. You would have said, it's going to be Motorola, it's going to be Nokia, it's going to be Ericsson. So it, it's very difficult to predict the future. Uh, so that's, one, that's the opportunity is that the race is open for everyone. Um, the, 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 so that's the way I look at it. Now, of course, the competitors we have are, are mighty giants. I mean, our, our biggest competitor is Google. Uh, when you see Google getting into the car, uh, you think that you know, it's getting a bit uncomfortable because we know that's the area we also want to uh, be, and that's our turf if you want the, the cockpit of the car. But we think we've got a level of agility and an understanding of the driver and the level of customization that we can work together with the car manufacturers for them to provide the best service to their customers. Um, and that's why we think that we're very well placed actually to play a major role in that mobility revolution. Right, and, and so would in, in terms of your revenue, I mean a lot of your revenue comes from car companies or what's the breakup? Yeah, so it's, it's for a long time it was from the consumer business that's changing now. We're transforming more and more uh, to a software platform. So it's uh, services, uh, developer community as well. We just have maps and traffic APIs for developer community. But a lot of it comes and a lot of the growth comes from car manufacturer where we supply either complete system or just the map or the, s or the traffic information. And we're working with most car manufacturers in the world. And we're working on with some of them on, on really interesting next generation of cars as well. And that's what I find very interesting is anticipating that driver behavior and how we make that, uh, that driver experience the best possible before we get complete self-driving cars. That's very interesting. So last question. So what does TomTom Tom mean? Where did that name come from? Yeah, so we were called, so we're a software company. We, you know, on the early days, we were called Palm Top Software, which, mm. you know, I can't even pronounce it now. It's, it was a mouthful. And uh, when Palm came to the market, everybody thought we were Palm. So there was a lot of confusion. So we wanted to, to have a name that was friendly, international, and reassuring, because we were already at this idea of being the, the driver companion, this little person that's next to you and that's reassuring you and guiding the way. So the Tom Tom's like the hands, like a tam tam, you know, when you get you hear the noise with the steps to, to find uh, your way. So that was uh, a friendly name, very international and, uh, and very easy to remember. But there was a lot of risk in that name because I remember when we first came with it, people, remember people in the industry, in the computer industry saying to me, Thompson, what do you do? Teddy bears? <laughs> so they always thought that it was crazy to arrive uh, in the tech industry with a name like TomTom. Tom. The name has served us very well, actually, and it's become now a, a, a global brand. And so uh, we're very happy we took that risk. It's a good note to end on. Thank you so much for speaking to us, Corinne Vickrieu.